It's an absolute pleasure to be, to be with all of you here today. Nothing compares to gathering in person for such an important event like the APAC CEO Summit. The energy as the APAC community comes together has always been invigorating and inspiring. This year marks the 13th year that PwC is the exclusive knowledge partner of the summit. We are proud to be part of the conversations that are aimed at creating a sustainable and inclusive APAC business community. Therefore, I'm incredibly honored to introduce to you a remarkable and inspiring leader who's made inclusive and equitable development a cornerstone of her country's growth agenda. The Right Honorable Jacinda, Jacinda Ardern started her pol political career at just 18 years of age when she joined the New Zealand Labour Party before entering Parliament 10 years later in 20, uh, 2008. A short nine years later, she was elected as the 40th Prime Minister of New Zealand and the country's third female leader. At just 37 years of age, Prime Minister Ardern was then the youngest female head of government. Over her years as a representative, she has been and continues to be a strong advocate for children, women, and the right of every New Zealander to have a meaningful work. She's highly praised for her strong and decisive, yet empathetic leadership in guiding New Zealand through the pandemic. At the height of the health crisis in 2020, the headline in one major magazine reads, and I quote, New Zealand's Prime Minister may be the most effective leader on the planet. Another, me <laughs> Another magazine listed her as the second greatest thinker for the COVID era, citing her ethos of kindness. Besides successfully leading her country in facing the pandemic, Prime Minister Ardern has also focused all her efforts on reviving and transforming New Zealand's economy. She's a firm believer that the health of a country's economy is closely tied to the health of its people. She was instrumental for New Zealand's landmark Child Poverty Reduction Act, the combination of productivity and growth and the well-being of its citizens laid out in the country's budget has successfully lifted 66,000 kids out of poverty in the past few years. As mentioned earlier, Prime Minister Ardern is a big champion of inclusive and equitable growth, particularly in empowering women and girls in the workforce and ensuring the country's indigenous people have access to economic opportunities. Her commitment has seen the Maori economy emerging as one of the fastest growing in New Zealand, the value of which is expected to reach 100 billion New Zealand dollars by 2030. She has also taken the lead on climate change through initiatives like the establishment of the Zero Carbon Act and the ban on future offshore oil and gas exploration in New Zealand. While some leaders might view trade as just an economic or business transaction, Prime Minister Ardern sees trade as a force for good. She believes that for the world to build back better, inclusive and sustainable trade are critical in driving global economic recovery and future prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute honor to introduce to you the Prime Minister of New Zealand, the right Honorable Jacinda Ardern. Thank you for that incredibly uh, generous introduction. I almost felt slightly embarrassed by the generosity of it and, and uh, needless to say, I feel like my comments now may be somewhat redundant because so much was covered, but nonetheless, I'll spend just a few moments with you here at this podium and then most of all I'm looking forward to the dialogue that we'll have between us and the prestigious panel I'm uh, humbled to be amongst. It is a pleasure to be joined by such respected leaders in the field and including 
uh, all of you in the audience today, and I'll pay particular acknowledgement to those uh, business representatives from AVAC from New Zealand and thank them for their uh, work uh, over the past period as well. This is a wonderful moment of reconnection as our region opens up for business, for travel, for education. In fact, I've just arrived uh, today from Vietnam where I've been with a number of New Zealand businesses. New Zealand businesses are finding opportunities in Vietnam's emerging and dynamic market. And in part, that's also, I hope, because of what we offer and what we represent. We have a strong and stable economy. We consistently rank number one in the world for ease of doing business. And we act with, I believe, integrity, honesty, and transparency when we engage in business also. Most importantly, we're open. And that's incredibly important in these turbulent times. COVID-19 was devastating for all of us. It took millions of lives. It continues to impact on our economies, our businesses, and the well-being of our people. And of course, business is at the heart of Asia Pacific community, and it can therefore be at the heart of the solutions and our recovery that we all seek as well. But in order to achieve that goal, I strongly believe that governments and businesses need to continue working together for the betterment of all. We need to keep our markets open to one another. This includes building confidence in predictable trade rules in the World Trade Organization and elsewhere. We need to emerge from these challenges with better infrastructure, a thriving small business ecosystem, and a workforce with the right skills for better jobs, not the same jobs, but better jobs. We need to future-proof our economies by transitioning away from fossil fuels, becoming more sustainable and climate-focused. We need to make sure that those groups that are being hardest hit by the pandemic are not left behind, particularly women, small business, rural populations, and indigenous people. We must exercise what New Zealand calls te aki, care for people, place, and planet, we must make a conscious effort to create and maintain a truly inclusive economic recovery. And that's what I'm looking forward to discussing today. But if I may just use one example, investing in women's economic empowerment sets a direct path towards poverty eradication, inclusive economic growth. Women are key agents for achieving the transformational economic, environmental and social changes required for sustainable development. Educate the girl child, and you change the lives of an entire community. Advancing Indigenous economic empowerment can also do much to deliver inclusive recovery. We can promote opportunities for Indigenous peoples through e-commerce and enhance the role of traditional knowledge in sustaining economic resilience. But an inclusive approach also means being aware of the makeup of our economies. Small and medium-sized enterprises, they account for more than 97% of all businesses across the Asia Pacific region, the heartbeat of all APEC economies, including back home in New Zealand. That means we need to recognise the value of SMEs and the people who work in them. All of these issues closely involve business, and I'm heartened to see you all today representing the region's business community and contributing actively to APEC's success, from MISMEs to multinationals, from established businesses to startups across a range of sectors. This speaks to the diversity, dynamism and resilience of our region's business community. Business has been at the heart of the APEC region's growth. I'm now sure it will be at the heart of the region's future. It all depends, of course, on the way we respond to the challenges that we face. Thank you again for the opportunity to be with you, and I'm looking forward to an exciting, dynamic conversation. Kia ora koutou katoa. My name is Stephen Engel. I'm the Chief North Asia Correspondent for Bloomberg Television. I've been with Bloomberg 19 years and in the Asia Pacific region for 32 years. So my life has been inclusive of many countries. I've lived in China twice, Japan. I've even lived in Thailand. I've lived in Taiwan. I've lived in Singapore and now Hong Kong for a third time over those 32 years. I've seen tremendous change over the last 32 years when I first moved to China in 1990. So things are changing, but are they necessarily changing for the better? Uh, I've seen, I've just come from Bali in the G20. We also have a Bloomberg New Economy Forum going on in Singapore. We just had the ASEAN meeting in Cambodia, and now we have APEC. 
And I kept on hearing a number of different people saying, multilateralism is under fire, it's under threat. Now, inclusive economy can, be, can work for individual countries like New Zealand. How are we gonna get it to work on a multilateral approach? And I think that's a, a big challenge, especially when geopolitics have kind of drowned out. I, all the discussions at the G20 in Bali had the backdrop of war in Ukraine and the geopolitics and the bifurcation of the world. So we need to talk about how we're gonna get this dialogue going on a multilateral front and get some solutions. There, those are my two cents. I want to introduce the other members of the panel here. We all know, of course, the Right Honorable Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Wonderful comments to start. We also have, to your right, a lady that I interviewed on Bloomberg Television this morning, and we talked about many of the subjects that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, it is uh, Kun Kapkarn. She is the chairperson of Casa Korn Bank, K Bank, here in uh, Thailand. Uh, also the former tourism minister, tourism and sports minister of Thailand. You're also the chairperson of Toshiba Thailand, and you're also the chairperson of Queen Sirigit Convention Center, where the APEC Leaders Summit is going to be held. You are a busy and very important lady. You have a challenge, Ms. Prime Minister. And to my right, we're outnumbered here, you know, Karen. Karen Bhatia, Google Vice President of Global Public Policy and Government Relations, also the former Deputy U.S. Trade Representative. You and I met 17 years ago on the roof of the Hong Kong Convention Center, the World Trade Organization talks. The world's changed a little bit since then. I would like to get, you addressed it a little bit, right, Honorable Prime Minister, about inclusive growth and inclusive development. I would like all of you to maybe address, because I don't like to hear all this jargon. What does inclusive growth mean to you specifically, for you as the Prime Minister, for you as the chairwoman of a, of a major commercial bank, and as you who've, who've traversed the public and private sectors? Please, Prime Minister. For me, it's, been, it's about being absolutely clear uh, that the singular focus that we as economies have tended to have over the past you know, 20, 30 years around GDP is not a marker of people's well-being. And surely, uh, whether or not you're a leader in business or uh, in uh, government, certainly in government, our eye has to be on more than just growth for growth's sake. It has to be on growth for the purposes of improving the well-being of all our people. And by all, I mean all. And so that's what inclusive growth means to, to me, and I would hope to many in New Zealand. How do we ensure that growth as a nation is lifting our well-being, lifting and all the markers of well-being? I'll expand on just that very, very um, briefly. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was Robert Kennedy that said that GDP measures, uh, uh, measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. And so when we came into government in 2017, we were very committed to the idea of take a measurement of our progress as a society beyond economic markers. And so we created in 2019 something called a wellbeing budget. Uh, we've tried to reorientate our work to just not being singularly focused on those economic measures, but what is the mental health of our nation? Uh, what is the, uh, the well-being of our children looking like? And what are our environmental impacts? Because, for instance, uh, a company in New Zealand that improves uh, its profitability, but in doing so also pollutes our country uh, and doesn't treat its workers properly, that is not lifting the well-being of our nation. And so that's again, a, a little bit of an idea, a flavour for me of what I mean by inclusive growth and certainly what, what we believe we collectively, government and business, need to be working towards in an environment where our consumers and our people expect more from us. I would like to answer with three questions. Oh. <laughs> with three questions. Everyone is invited to answer in your mind. How do you measure success? As CEO, as business leader, how do you measure success? I believe in Thailand. I'm talking not only as a business leader, but also a mother of two children. Success 
should not be short term of market share of the most highest profit because that can be short term. Long term, that is more important. Long term means that we want to grow with sustainability. We want to grow so that we can pass on. I'm from the family business. We want to grow as what you have said and hand over to my children and maybe my grandchildren. And then it comes to the second question. So whose responsibility is to take care of the younger generation? If we are going to do business, not only just for ourselves, is it the government responsibility? Is it the duty of certain associations and whatnot? Or is it a citizenship duty that we have to take care of this? And to me, and I think to many of us, it is our duty, and that's why um, I think we are here. Last but not least, inclusive growth. I don't think that we have just begun to do this. It has been um, done several years ago, ages. But how come it's not sustainable? How can we make inclusive growth sustainable? And that is something that if I have time, I would like to touch on this, that with the speakers here and the people here and definitely the people online, I think we are here to take action and make sure that the action will last and passing on to the younger generation. So uh, I would like to touch on later about people, which is the most important. How can we care for people? And people should not mean only us, family, our business uh, stakeholders, but community. And now it's a global community. We need to be, con have, uh, be creative. We have, need to have uh, concentration, uh, connectivity for the Chamber of Commerce. I'm also on with the Chamber of Commerce. We say no one is best in everything. But we, this is a great time to connect the dots okay. of each country. We're going to talk about people. We're going to talk about policy. But we want to get your view on this, on the true nature of inclusive growth. What does it mean to you? You know, Stephen, you, you referenced uh, 17 years ago. Uh, we were, we were uh, at then uh, at a moment of great hope that this international multilateral next trade round following a series of accomplishments, the creation of the World Trade Organization and so forth, and this was going to move us forward. And, um, and it failed. It failed. The Doha round didn't come together. And since that time, there hasn't been a major multilateral trading round. And when you scratch at why that's happened, there are a lot of things you can point to, but I think one is that there hasn't been inclusive growth, that there are too many people out there who look at institutions like the World Trade Organization, APEC, gatherings like these, and don't feel a sense of identification with it. They feel a sense of alienation. They feel like what is discussed here doesn't impact them because it's not fundamentally impacting their day to day. Um, and so when I think about inclusive growth and its importance, I think about how do we rebuild trust in the people of all of the APEC economies in the importance of the mission of APEC, which is to create that integrated uh, uh, region, a region where there are enhanced growth opportunities. I, I personally believe that there is a lot that can come from the public sector in setting the right guardrails uh, around that. I think regulation has a component of it. I also think there is a significant role that the private sector has to play. And, and, and speaking as, a, as, a, as now a representative of the technology community, I think technology has been and can continue to be an enabler of, of inclusive growth. But there is more that needs to be done. This is a question for all of you, and I'll start with the Prime Minister. Where are we on inclusive growth coming out of the pandemic? How did that change everything? Obviously, New Zealand was lauded internationally for your quick response, but we're all in the same boat now. We're trying to pick up the pieces and, and see where, where we can find that kind of growth. There's digital nomads everywhere now. People are leaving their jobs after a short amount of time. People are moving all around. 
we don't know what the future is going to hold. Is inclusive growth taking a step back through the pandemic, or do you see some optimism? I can tell you that, and, and speaking here beyond New Zealand's borders, it has absolutely left women worse off. Uh, and, that is, and, and that is statistically true. Tens of millions of women and girls uh, dropped further into poverty as a result. And you, can, you can see why that would be. And, uh, in the informal economy uh, and the sectors uh, which COVID hit the hardest were dominated by, uh, by women uh, in, those, in those parts of the economy. And so that then lends the question of how do we make sure in our recovery that we target those areas? Now, again, that's a general statement. If I just then cast my lens back to uh, New Zealand and granted with all the caveats that we're a, uh, that we are, um, you know, a relatively wealthy country, but we, we looked back at the experience we had during the GFC and we said, okay, that was the last economic crisis we experienced. What did we observe in that period? And we observed that the hardest hit in terms of our unemployment statistics, they were women and they were our indigenous communities. So we immediately started thinking about what are the universal things we can do to make sure that people stay connected to work. And so we put in place a wage subsidy that actually in the end touched 62% of all jobs ended up being supported by that wage subsidy. And then we started honing in on the sectors where we saw women in particular uh, were dominant. And then we also looked at the areas that last time we saw massive closures. Construction happened to be one of them, and we're a country with a housing crisis. We didn't want to see that occur. So we made some targeted decisions. We made apprenticeships free. We expanded where those apprenticeships reached into, and we tried to bring in extra women into them, and we increased the number of apprenticeships by 60%. Mm. But for women, it was over 100%. Uh, we then started looking at job creation opportunities, simple things. We knew if more families would fall into poverty. So we put a program out that provided food in schools. So by reaching out and using this large scale power of uh, the government to create a food in schools program, byproduct of that, not only did kids get a healthy meal every day in a tough time, we created over 2,000 jobs that we knew women would take up because they were in school hours. So just thinking, just looking and casting our eye over those who are most likely to be impacted and creating opportunities to try and ensure that we buffeted people through those periods. That was what we've tried to do. It is not a perfect experience because we are not a perfect country, but those were some of the things that we learned through this period. And one final note, our unemployment for Māori for women and Pacific is half what it was during the global financial crisis. Before this uh, panel, I did go through the New Zealand government website and looked at some of those numbers on the gender inequality. I saw that on average, the male in New Zealand gets about 10% better pay than about, female. About nine. It, it, ha, but how, not to split hairs, it's still bad. <laughs> <laughs> how much has that been exacerbated downward through the pandemic? As you said, the, the, the women and the minorities uh, suffered the worst. Yeah, so uh, there, is a, there is a lag in some of that data, but I do not expect that to have improved. Um, but that's about us saying, well, look, we're, what can we do in sector by sector, and how can we show leadership? Last week, New Zealand became the sixth country in the world to have 50% women in our parliament. But what's the private sector doing to make sure that that's happening on their boards and in their leadership? To give you an example, we know that as a, a New Zealand businesses, those who export are generally doing better. But only 14% of our exporters are led by women. So there's a job for us to do, and it's not just, it's just, not just in government. In the private sector too, I issue that challenge. What are we doing to reduce that gender pay gap and the gap in leadership in, at, at every single level? Kun Kapkorn. We talked about this this morning on Bloomberg Television about the gender uh, inequality in Thailand. You are a remarkable individual. You are a chairperson of many different boards. But you were telling me in Thailand there may be a number of CEOs who are female, but not a lot of boardrooms filled with females. Well, first I have to report to you, Excellency, um, K-Bank. <laughs> um, we are uh, the institutions, uh, same as many others in Thailand, where we value women. So both chairman and CEO that you have just met, women. And we have women on board, about 43%. So uh, that, that is... 
So, but, but, but then again, um, I have to say that um, according to the statistic from, from someone from, from United States, about 40% of CEO in Thailand, women, 47% CFO women, which is probably the highest. But then again, there's a weak point that we need to improve, is women on board. That is something that we still may be less than 10%, but we are working on this, maybe because uh, we haven't really thought about this. But um, with the epic happening here, I think we learn, and, and you are the one who inspires us. And another thing, that is the women in politics. That will be something that, it doesn't mean that uh, they don't want us, but maybe because women ourselves, maybe we are scared, um, maybe we are still weak in certain things, and so therefore um, that is something that we need to do. And I also have to, to tell you that with this epic come, uh, uh, happening in, 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 in Bangkok now, we have young generation, we call Young Entrepreneur Chamber, YEC, about 200 of them from every province of Thailand, because we believe in the future. And they will look at us and improve from this. So I really do believe that there will be more and more of the female working together in order to shape up the next generation and the future of our country. But, but another thing, allow me to also say that you, you said that whether um, this is a good opportunity or not uh, after COVID. Um, I have to say we have to thank COVID. It hurts us a lot, but COVID has bring changes mm. in Thailand, especially for tourism. I, I, we, we are passionate about tourism, I, I do have, and we work on this. And Thailand used to receive almost 40 million international tourists to Thailand before COVID. Should we be happy about that? As I say, if success measure only by figures, but that is not. Right. We only have the quantity, but not quality. Now, we already announced with the government, put into the 20 years um, um, policy of Thailand, we are going for quality with sustainably tourism. So meaning it should be wealth distribution. Reduce seeing the gap between the super rich and the very poor. Yes. Tourism will bring not just money, but will bring friendship and understanding, heart to heart, <laughs> people to people, and that is on that note, the OECD says inequalities are now at the highest levels in 30 years. Top 10% of income earners take home over 10 times more pay than the bottom 10. Karen, we had to give way to you know, our better halves on the, on the stage here. And we've had three different issues before we allowing you to talk. That's the right uh, ratio. But how has the pandemic obviously changed? I mean, the digitalization and the platform economy is supposed to be the great equalizer, isn't yeah. it? Has it been? Well, I, I, let me come to that. But first, if I could, uh, just to acknowledge the Prime Minister, in addition to the other things that New Zealand did so effectively coming out of uh, COVID and during it, the commitment that we've seen coming out under the Prime Minister's leadership to digital skilling has been extraordinary. and. We've been so proud to be able to partner um, you know, with, the, with the New Zealand government on a couple of initiatives. One it has to do with the scaling of small and medium-sized businesses, which is exactly as, as the Prime Minister said, such a key uh, spur to, um, to, to, to empowering uh, particularly the underrepresented women-owned business, but also those at the bottom of the pyramid generally. You know, if small businesses are a mechanism, and particularly during the time of COVID, what we saw was that small businesses that were digitally enabled, that were skilled, connected and skilled, um, survived at a much higher rate than those that did not. And it stands to reason, you know, if you are limited to the community in which you are operating in, it is much harder to get through a crisis like the pandemic than if you have the world uh, to be able to operate in. So 
through the work that we, we did through with the, the New Zealand government, the Digital Boost program that she launched was, uh, was extraordinary. And then also in terms of the skilling of individuals, um, underrepresented groups. So the Manaya Kalani uh, Educational Trust, for instance, has been uh, another terrific experience for us. So I think from our vantage point, the role of business in this setting is to, it, it has to be done in partnership with government. But partnering with government on skilling programs, particularly targeted at the underrepresented and at small and medium-sized businesses, I think is one of the big things coming out of this. Um, the, the, to, with respect to sort of how we see things coming out of the pandemic generally, look, um, yes, the technology was adopted. It has become more ubiquitous. And there are parts of society that heretofore weren't connected that we're kind of forced to be as a result of the pandemic. One thinks about sometimes older uh, members of society who might have been reluctant and were, were forced to, to connect in. And that is potentially something good going forward that we're going to have people connected. In this region alone, in the, in the Southeast Asia region, we saw over the last three years, the numbers of connected, uh, internet connected people went from about 325 million to 425 million, a hundred million increase in the course of three years. That is good, that is going to create opportunities, but, but to have those materialize, they're gonna have to be married with the right set of government policies and commitments, and that includes skilling, it also includes investment in infrastructure, and it includes adopting the right set of regulations to enable those, those uh, investments to be made. Well, obviously at Bloomberg, we cover it on a daily basis, uh, the prospects of, of a global recession coming. We're coming out of a pandemic and into a very high inflationary environment, obviously. We have what some would say is a food crisis. We have an energy crisis. We have geopolitical concerns uh, in Europe, obviously. Uh, and there's pressure on workforces as well. As you know very well, Karen, uh, whether it's Meta or Twitter, they're, they're laying off thousands and thousands of people. I think a key investor of yours, of Google's, had called also for some layoffs at, at Alphabet. Uh, your, your growth rate of hiring is about 20% per annum since 2017, so the last five years. Is, does this set things back? I don't mean to be the devil's advocate so much here in the, in the negative voice here, but we have to look at does uh, the prospect of a global recession stall some of these initiatives that we're talking about. Maybe Prime Minister, you can, you can start. You talked a little bit about, uh, you know, whether or not we're in a phase where multilateralism is, is dead. Uh, you've, you've been subsequently just touched on growing inequality uh, and now the tough times that our, our people find themselves in, in this, you know, highly inflationary uh, post COVID recovery. And uh, I, you've already heard me issue a challenge to the private sector. Now I'm going to issue a challenge back to uh, my colleagues uh, and my, those who operate in the polit political sphere. We're at a juncture where I think it's incredibly important that politicians speak openly and honestly with hope around the, the response that can best support our people in these times. And we as politicians, we always have two options in these difficult times. You either have the option of uh, looking for whomever or whatever to blame in these times. Ah, you know, we're in, a, we're in a highly inflationary environment. It's this thing's fault and it's this thing's fault. And by the way, if you want a solution on high food costs, then we should stop trading. We should move into protectionism. We'll call it food sovereignty and, and we'll just focus on ourselves. And, and stoke the fear. Worse yet, you see some who might, for instance, blame migrationary flows and, uh, and you know, jobs going to communities who they paint as other. There's that option that politicians have. Or there's the alternative option where you say, well, actually, these are hard times, but the solution is for us to continue to look outwards, uh, to focus on, for instance, trade and our goods and services that lift all. So how do we make sure our trade agenda does that? Uh, by ensuring that it supports our indigenous businesses and our small businesses and our women. And how do we talk more openly about the gains that we have made to date? So how do we defend the gains that we've made, the progress we've made? So to use that hopeful agenda rather than that fearful one. It's so easy to do fear. It takes effort and work to do hope. But hope is what we need if we want to bolster our multilateral institutions. 
because the fear option, that is, that is where we slide backwards. And we have seen that in our political rhetoric. So I'm a big defender as a, you know, as a leader of a small island nation, five million people. Uh, our wealth is dependent on our ability to trade openly, uh, fairly with others. And so in these kind of environments, it's fearful for us when we see those players who seek to retrench. So we will, we will defend and speak openly, but we will also speak with hope. Those institutions, our openness, is what has got us to the point where we have seen such rapid development for APEC economies. It is. And now for the next period, we have that opportunity again. We just need to bring more people with us. Inclusivity in our growth will be what actually allows us to continue on in this way. If we don't, we will have dissatisfied uh, citizens and, and more politicians who stoke fear. For this panel, you said you wanted to bring up an important issue to you, and that was dealing with changing policy. You, I mean, from government policy, obviously every industry faces regulation, but one of your biggest challenges is facing political whims that change too quickly. You start an initiative, and by the time you start getting it with some momentum, policy changes again. Maybe this is Your my personal point of view. <laughs> Blaming the government. Personal point of view, but, but I, I, I had the opportunity to, to be with the government for three years, but uh, the rest of my life, uh, I always be in the private sectors. Uh, that's why I say that we always have good policies, good plans, sometimes too many good plans. And um, so how to make it happen, and then how to make it happen with sustainability. And this, I'm not so sure whether it happens in other countries or not, but um, in Thailand, for example, when, um, once we come up with good plans, and we start to do it, we select a project, we select a location, we start doing this, we help people, and blah, blah, blah. And then we change people. Leader change. New leader come and they want my own project. Policy not change, but the project change. For example, in tourism, for, uh, maybe during my term I said that, okay, we would like to promote secondary town, okay, 12 towns. And then maybe the new one coming up that, okay, we want to promote secondary town but the new ones. Um, I would say that um, inclusive growth should come with concentration, meaning we cannot touch all, like in Thailand, we don't have big budget. And so therefore, we, we need to prioritize, select what we should do first, and then continuity is more important. And especially, for example, like tourism, you require like five to 10 years five to 10 years to make it really happen. But more than that, continuity meaning that we are not giving them fish. We must teach the local how to fish. And that is why it takes some time in order to gloom up the local people, in order to stand up by themselves and do it by themselves. And not to wait for us to say, okay, next, you do this, and they will do it, and then next, to take order, no. So, so therefore, um, if I can share, and I think that is something if that we if we, we can can um, allow this panel to be a part of this, how to make the inclusive growth sustainable, teach them how to fish, and then don't change policy. And the one who should do this is the private sector. Is the private sector people <laughs> yes the man who is in charge of government policy here you're chomping uh, at the bit I, I don't know about in charge of much of anything at the point but but quickly I, if I could if I could offer a thought on um, the point about macroeconomic headwinds and the role of some of the things we've talked about yeah. here I mean I, I'm uh, what's always amazing to me is that at, at the time when we most desperately, I think as a global economy, need to be leaning into trade and lean to be leaning into technology, that's the moment where you see people pulling back. And, and frankly, you know, right now if you think about challenges like inflation, 
you know, trade and technology are going to be part of the solution to this. It is, it is every evidence is that, is that the ability to trade across borders, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses to trade across borders, lowers costs, increases uh, competitiveness, and thereby allows for economies to come out of this period more strongly. So the first thing that I would say is, now more than ever we need to double down. And then just to underscore again the point the Prime Minister made about the need for, for political leadership around the world to, to sort of not lose optimism. I go back to the period uh, after the Doha round. That failed, but do you want to know what succeeded at that point? And this was due again to, to New Zealand, Singapore, and Brunei came knocking on, on my door, our door, then in the United States, and said, let's launch this crazy trade idea called TPP, subsequently called CPTPP. Yep. It was called the P4 back then, actually. Nobody thought this thing was going to succeed, but we pushed it forward. Sadly, I regret to say, my government ultimately backed out of it. <laughs> but, 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 but to the betterment of the world, New Zealand and others continued to push it forward. And so today, we have a further bulwark against against protectionism as a result. So again, I just think it's a moment of optimism that we need to we need to see. It's a spaghetti bowl of different acronyms of mixed yeah. metaphors there because now it's the what Indo-Pacific Economic Framework I was it IPEF. IPEF. Yeah. Yes. So we we we're out of time. How is that possible? <laughs> 15 seconds. I always want to give the final word because we never have enough time to bring up all the issues I want to bring up. I always want to give last words to our esteemed panelists. Prime Minister, do you have any final comments on the subject that you wanted to make? Uh, CPTPP is just a really good example. We have RCEP. We have the ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. We just uh, added an upgrade to that recently. Uh, and to give you one small example, in five years, New Zealand's two-way trade just with Vietnam has increased by more than 50%. It's good for them and it's good for us. And so let's hold on to the benefits of that economic integration, but let's make sure that those benefits reach everyone. Because when they reach everyone, that is when you make sure that there is that wider support for that, e for that economic agenda, for that globalization agenda, for that multilateral agenda. So I finish with a message of hope. I know, I know I'm out of time, and I'm not going to give you the final word card, but uh, do you have final words? Then I'll have... I, I, uh, just, just to underscore a point that sort of came out a little bit in some of the other comments, which is, I think, this forum, the, the, the APEC forum, has over the course of its history had a number of successes. One of the things it's done very effectively is get people quietly, different regulators, into a room to try and not necessarily tie things down definitively, but share best practices and come up with norms. And, and I do think that as you look at what's happening in a number of different spaces around regulation, as, as, as was referenced, we're seeing just this sort of spaghetti bowl, this explosion of different things, which is making it challenging for, I think, the public and private sector to come together around certain common standards. So I would hope that as APEC looks forward into the next year, that becomes a significant priority. Kung Kapkan, final words? Collaboration doesn't mean another MOU. <laughs> I really hope a lot of people saying uh, that we should create trust and confidence. I would say faith. Faith. You must have faith that you can make a difference. You should have faith in your country. And you should have faith in the epic, the global unity. And you start with yourself. Every individual has power. And we can change the world to be a better place. Thank you. Very well said. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our distinguished panelists, including, of course, the Right Honourable Prime Minister from New Zealand.